You have seen it many times before. A parent dies, the adult children are in conflict. Worse yet, a parent dies without a will or a trust. A wise lawyer once said, if you hate your children and want them to hate each other, die without a will. Sometimes brothers and sisters can be greedy. Greed can cause siblings to fight over all kinds of things, money, property, inheritance. Dad loved you more. Mom loved me more. What it all says, I'm not quite sure, but, but these things happen. Maybe you know what I'm talking about. And sometimes people get so wrapped up in their desire to acquire. And that's what happened one day. Jesus has been teaching the people. He's been teaching them about the way God values people. And he's talking a little bit about the day we will have to stand before our maker. And a man, a younger brother, comes up in the crowd. He hears Jesus talking and he thinks, well, Jesus seems wise to me. I'm sure he'll take my side. And so Luke tells us in Luke 12, Luke 12, verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. You know, Jesus, you seem to know a lot. You seem to have authority. Tell my brother what he's doing isn't right. Now remember in this culture, the older brother always got twice as much as everyone else. And so it's obviously a younger brother going to an older brother. Maybe he's not even getting half as much. We don't know the details. But Jesus, surely you'd want to take my side. Surely you will help me out. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And you, I wonder, is that what you would expect Jesus to say? You know, just kind of blow it off. Maybe the man's still grieving. Maybe it's been some time. But he seems to have no interest in deciding this kind of problem. Jesus rarely seemed to have interest in helping people to grow in their addiction to greed. But he said to them, and he said to them, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Let me put it away. Jesus basically, put it another way. Jesus basically says, beware when you covet what someone else has. He says, beware when you think you need more than you've been given. He says, beware when you have an insatiable hunger for more and more and more. Why? For one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Why? Because your life is about more than just money and possessions and stuff. And today we're going to talk about some of the steps that we can take to create a lasting legacy. And so there's a question I want us to consider today. Um, how can my life outla outla outlast me? How can my life outlast me? Will you say that with me? How can my life outlast me? And it's an important question. It's an important question because the decisions that we make today could have an internal impact. They could make an eternal difference. How can my life outlast me? I'll invite you to open your bulletin and you'll see your sermon notes printed out for you. They'll help you to follow along with some of our scriptures and there's a place to write down anything you'd like to remember and take with you. And if you open that on up, you'll see our prayer and study guide. And these are daily scriptures and devotions you can take with you into the week. And I hope you'll do that. But Jesus, from this point, then he turns to his disciples. He turns to the crowd and he tells them a parable. And this parable, it doesn't begin in contentment. It begins with a problem. A rich man has a problem. And Jesus says, the land of a rich man produced abundantly. So this man is the beneficiary of a spectacular harvest. A harvest so great that he has nowhere to store all of his grain. And Jesus said, and he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. I mean, it is a miraculous harvest. I mean, just the biggest harvest he's ever seen. He hasn't even imagined a harvest this big, or otherwise he would have already maybe built bigger barns. His barns will not contain all of the grain, all of the harvest that is coming in. And then, still talking to himself, or he thinks to himself, actually, he thought to himself, he deliberated 
with himself. He has a discussion with himself saying, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. And then still talking to himself, he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and all my goods. And this seems kind of drastic, doesn't it? I mean, he doesn't just take the barns he has and then build a a wing on or build another barn next to it. No, he says, I've got to pull down these barns that I have in order to build bigger barns. I mean, it's that big of a harvest. If he's made enough money from the harvest to be tearing down old barns and building new ones, I mean, this harvest must be something, nothing short of miraculous. And he hasn't just done well, he's done very well. He's done miraculously well. And he continues talking to himself, and I will say to my soul, notice that when you've been this successful, you know, when you've been, had this much come in, you know, you, there's no need to consult anyone else. All conversation is monologue just with yourself. And so he continues talking with himself. And, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax. Eat, drink, be merry, live the good life. I know this story. I mean, do you know this story? Have you lived this story ever? I mean, I have a job, a, a pretty good job, if I do say so myself. My, my marriage is pretty stable. My kids are great. They're adorable. Stay out of trouble. I mean, life is pretty good. Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry, live the good life. Now, If you read this parable in your Bible, it probably calls it the parable of the rich fool. But Jesus doesn't call it that. In fact, Jesus seems intrigued at first by something else other than the man. He seems intrigued by the land and its miraculous bounty, this blessing that comes from God, the land of a rich man produced abundantly. What first impresses Jesus is this miraculous, barn-bursting harvest, a gift. But the blessing is a burden. And the gift becomes a big problem. And then the story becomes, how do I manage my miracle? What should I do? I have no place to store my crops. I will do this. I will pull down my barns. I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say, relax, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, be merry. How do I manage my miracle? It's a story about that. How do I manage my miracle? And all the talk in this story, at least the first part of it, is a monologue from the rich farmer. He talks to himself. He plans for himself. He congratulates himself. He celebrates himself. I mean, he only thinks of himself. He doesn't think of his wife. He doesn't think of his friends. He doesn't think of his children. He certainly doesn't think about future generations. He doesn't think about his church or the poor or ministry or God. It's all me and mine. All he talks about is my crops, my barns, my grain, my goods, my soul. And it's only at the end of the story that another voice speaks up, that another voice intrudes God's voice, the voice of God. And the voice doesn't accuse the rich man of injustice or immorality or even greed. But God said to him, you fool. That's one of the worst insults that you can say in the Bible. We're not supposed to say it. But here God does. You fool. Why does he say you fool? I mean, he didn't get what he got unjustly. He worked really hard for it. He didn't steal. He didn't work at Enron. He did God. Why did God call him a fool? You fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? End of story. In the Greek, it says, fool, this very night they shall demand your life. They. Well, who is they? Well, I think they might be the things that he thinks he owns. The story closes with the question, and whose will they, the things, be? He thought the things were his problem, his opportunity, his insurance to manage as he pleased. But surprise, his life is owned by his things more than he owns them. 
Can we not understand the irony of a man who thought he had so many things only to discover too late, too late that his things owned him? You know, there's lots of gadgets and computers and, and all kinds of things that they're supposed to make our lives smoother and better and, well, and more efficient, right? You know, we all carry these little things around, and I'm not against this kind of thing, but I just wonder, does this th- do you run this thing or does it run you? I wonder, when a notification goes off and it dings, does it run you? Do you check your text? Do you check your email? Do you check your messages? Does it run us? I'll tell you, um, some days it seems that I have no other purpose other than to tend to, to care for it, to take care and to fix the things that I supposedly own. I'll just share without going too much into it that over the last seven or eight months, it seems like I've had my car in the shop like six different times. It caring for it. It hasn't been treating me right. I had to take care of it. And oh, what a burden it is. We thought we were managing our modern lives, but our gadgets, our things have been managing us. Now it's all monologue as we pat ourselves on our back for our great material purpose and success, our medical technological miracles, our great work as A-plus parents, our SAT scores, you know, our homes, our jobs, our health, all these things that, that seem to bring security, that we seem to be running. And just when we get it kind of all fenced in, all hedged up, all secured, all insured, there comes that voice from the outside, that intrusive voice of God. But God said to him, you fool, this very night they shall demand your life of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? And Jesus kind of takes a step back and he sums up this parable. He says, so it is with those who store up treasures for themselves but are not rich toward God. You know what I think this man missed? It's a simple lesson. He forgot that God owns it all. Even in the face of this great blessing from God, even in the face of this tremendous harvest, a true blessing from God, He doesn't see God blessing him. He thinks he's done it just himself. I remember an old movie uh, Jimmy Stewart was in. It called Shenandoah. It was about the Civil War. And he's a hardworking man. And they were in northern Virginia. And they didn't have slaves, which was a good thing. And, And Jimmy Stewart prays this prayer. He prays, Oh, Lord, thank you for all that we have received, even though we wouldn't have it if we hadn't worked for it ourselves. Ever feel that way? Thank you, God. When the land produced, this man thinks, it's because I worked so hard. I did it. Yay for me. I own it all. It's all for my enjoyment. But Jesus calls us to a different way, to be stewards of all that God has given us. What's a steward like? Well, a steward's kind of like a stockbroker. If you give your money to a stockbroker, you're not just saying, here's a nice birthday present. Here's my money. It's for you. You just take it. Use it however you want. No, you want a stockbroker that will care for your money, that might grow your money, that might then give it back to you with interest, right? And that's kind of what it's like to be a steward. Uh, You know, we want that stockbroker to use our money for the purposes that would be pleasing to us. To be a steward of God's blessings is to use what God has given us to live and to bless people in ways that will be pleasing to God. We manage the blessings that God gives us in a way that is pleasing to God. And it makes me wonder, where do you store your treasures? We'll get to that in a minute. Where do you store your treasures? How do you manage your miracles? Where do you store your treasures? I mean, do you tear down your barns and build bigger ones to store all of your wealth and say to your soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for the future. Eat, drink, be merry, relax, live the good life. Or I wonder, do you have a grander vision? I mean, are you one of those people who only thinks of yourself? Or are you one of those people who you can't help but think about other people? Can't help but think about the needs of other people? I wonder, are you one of those people who only sees limitations, who only thinks about what you can't do? Or are you one of those people who sees possibilities? One of those people who thinks what you could do, how you might bless another person? In response to this parable, Jesus gives some free yet very valuable advice about treasure management. And he kind of says a similar thing here in in this chapter in Luke as he does 
in Matthew 6 in the Sermon on the Mount. And I like the way Matthew reports what Jesus said. Matthew 6, verse 19, Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, Jesus says that your heart follows your treasure. I mean, when you look at your checkbook or your online bank statement, you're bound to see your heart in there somewhere. Now, most of us like to think if we get our hearts right, then the money will follow. We'll get, we'll get our treasure right. But that's not really what Jesus says here. Jesus says that when you get your treasure right, your heart will follow. And it's almost as if uh, this, our treasure, and this, our heart, are connected. It's almost like they're connected by an invisible rope. These two never get too far from each other. And Jesus wants to think about our money and our possessions differently than the world thinks. And these things you've prepared, whose will they be? In his letter to young Timothy, the Apostle Paul writes this, of course there's great gain in godliness combined with contentment, for we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. It's one of those simple reminders, isn't it, that we have these things, they're not bad things, but we have them, but we can't take them with us. They don't cross over into heaven at least with us when we go. And I wonder if you've ever looked at the names in our stained glass. I wonder if you ever looked at some of these plaques that we have out here in the narthex. They, they list off some of the people who, who gave gifts when we were building this sanctuary, when we were doing things to continue to bless this church and to bless the people who worship here. I wonder if you've ever noticed them. Now, some of you may have, and if you've been in this church a long time, you may know some of the names. You may know some of the people who are listed there. If you haven't been here real long, you might not know any of them, and they wouldn't know you either. But here's what I can tell you. When they gave those gifts, they thought of you. They thought of people in this church. They thought of younger generations. They thought of people who would come to this church decades later. They had a grander vision. And what's amazing about it is whether it was easy to give or hard to give, they didn't just think about today or yesterday. They didn't just think about their own needs, but they thought about the needs of others. And they thought of you in the future, even as they took a step to create a lasting legacy. And I believe they wanted to bless generation after generation with significant gifts why did they do this? Well, Ernest Campbell, who used to be the pastor of Riverside Church in New York City, wrote a little poem called Understanding Maturity that may answer that question. Why did they do what they did? He wrote this, To be young is to study in schools we did not build. To be mature is to build schools in which we will not study. To be young is to swim in pools we did not dig. To be mature is to dig pools in which we will not swim. To be young is to send under trees we did not plant. To be mature is to plant trees under which we will not sit. To be young is to dance to music we did not write. To be mature is to write music to which we will not dance. To be young is to worship in churches we did not build. To be mature is to build churches in which we may not worship. And I think some of the people in our church, some of our forebears, they understood this kind of maturity of stewardship. They understood what it means to live in a way as to bless that you're blessed to be a blessing to others. And they had that opportunity because, you know, we started in, down in what is now the parlor as a sanctuary, built this sanctuary in the 60s, you know, and that was the opportunity in the church to, to give in that way and to build that kind of legacy. And here we sit years and decades later, and I wonder, you know, does that mean that we don't have the same opportunities to invest in God's ministry? Does it limit our opportunity to provide for the future of our church? Does it deny us the ability to give abundant blessings to God and to be part of the kingdom? I wonder, what is left for us? Well, one of the things that is left for us is planned giving. 
Planned giving is a person's ultimate expression of their faithfulness. And I'll just say this, that many times when we think about stewardship, living as stewards, we all kind of have generally three pockets that we might give from. The, the first pocket is the, what we give in our annual gifts to the church. And sometimes we talk about tithing, giving one-tenth uh, one of what we earn in a year to help with God's ministry in the church throughout the year. A second pocket might be if we were to do a capital campaign and there was a second mile gift that someone wanted to give that was kind of a major gift or towards going to something above and beyond what we normally do. And then that third pocket is planned giving. Planned giving. Uh, I'll tell you, most universities, if you went to college, they're good at planned giving, aren't they? There's always a building to be built. There's always something that you could give or, or, you know, or an endowment to be established. And it's really the same in the church. We may spend four years in our favorite college. We may spend a lifetime in our church or, or a significant part of our life in a church, being blessed by God and being blessed by God's ministry through the church. And so planned giving is an opportunity to give out of our accumulated assets or wealth, things that we've accumulated through our life. Many times, although not always, they are opportunities to give a gift that will go on once we no longer live on this earth before our resurrection in heaven. A simple way to do this might be to leave a, a tenth or to leave a tithe of our estate, of our will, um, to God's ministry through the church or to a favorite ministry through the church to create a lasting legacy of ministry. Now, the Apostle Paul also tells us this in 1 Timothy 6. He says, As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure of a good foundation for the future, so that they might take hold of the life that really is life. Do you want to take hold of the life that really is life? In his book, Wit, Wisdom, and Moxie, Jared Panis writes, those who provide for charity in their estate plans live longer than the general public, six years beyond the actuarial table. So uh, just your preacher told you this, if I, if I want to do some plan giving, either here or elsewhere even, I'll probably live six years longer. I mean, take hold of the life that really is life. Where is your treasure? Who do you love? What are those ministries that you've been part of that bless people and you want to ensure that they continue to bless people in the future? What ministries would you like to strengthen? Because we remember, we talked about this our first week in this series, we're blessed to be a blessing. That's how God creates us as rivers, as hoses, not as just a lake that gathers water, but as we bless, the blessings pass through us. God blesses us so that we can be a blessing to others. I've invited uh, David Battles to, from the United Methodist Foundation to come and, and share with us just for a few minutes. So, David, I'm going to invite you to come on up. And I wanted to let David talk just a little bit about an opportunity we might have, any of us, to make a planned gift. And one of the things, have a seat, David, that I would say up front is that um, sometimes we may think, well, oh, I don't have enough money to make a planned gift. But any gift, no matter how big or how small, anyone could give out of their assets or, or, or plan to do so in the future. And so, David, I wanted to just kind of let you share, and we have this, um, this uh, brochure in your bulletin too, which that he's going to share a little bit with us, which types of gifts uh, could we give. So what are some of those planned gifts? What kinds of planned gifts could we give through our church? Well, there's basically three categories of planned gifts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Gifts that pay you income gifts that can be used today or gifts that can take effect after your lifetime. Those gifts that pay you income would include charitable gift annuities, charitable remainder trust. Gifts that can be used today would be an outright gift of cash, securities, real estate, and then gifts that take effect after our lifetime, and this is probably the most significant, would be a gift through our will or trust, a life insurance gift, Oftentimes, this can be a very inexpensive way to make a major gift. Retirement plans, and retirement plans are excellent tools um, from a tax point of view. And right now, we have an opportunity to, if you're over 70 and a half, you can make a gift directly from your IRA to the church and not have to include that in your income. So that's a real benefit because of the higher... Uh, deductibles. 
and then you can have a retained life estate. So these are, these are the major categories of right. uh, gifts. Okay. Well, how would I benefit if I wanted to make a planned gift to the church? Well, I think the big benefit is knowing that you've made a lasting le legacy. You know, when I'm working with individuals, it's amazing how once they've completed the gift, they feel so good about it. You know, they said, you know, they, they feel like they've really accomplished something that's, that will live on forever. Mm -hmm. In addition, there's tax benefits. Um, you know, if you ha make a gift that where you receive income, mm -hmm. you would have that income during your retirement. So there's right. a lot of different options. Yeah. Giving really feels good though, doesn't it? it? That's does. one of the blessings yes. of being generous. Um, how would the church benefit from receiving a planned gift? Planned gifts usually come to the church in the form of an endowment. And what an endowment is, you preserve the principal and then you make annual payments. For instance, if the church received an endowment for $100,000, um, if it was invested at the foundation, you know, our average earnings are 7% over the years. So if we're earning 7%, and if we're paying out 5% of the fair market value, over a 20-year period, the church would receive about $122,000. And then the value of that endowment has gone from $100,000 to around $150,000. Mm -hmm. Well, if I were interested in learning more, how can I get more information about planned gifts? We have a booklet, which is a guide for planning your estate, planning your legacy. It's free. Um, you can either go online and get it online, or what a lot of people do is they go ahead and contact us. We send it out to you. We have a lot of materials. We have a brochure on about every different type of gift mechanism that we have. Um, and we're just here to help you. We're here to, to do estate planning seminars, wills and trusts, wills and uh, trust uh, workshops. Uh, plan giving workshops and etc. Mm -hmm. And to whom would I speak if I wanted to make a planned gift? You speak to me. That's that's what I do. I uh, I work with individuals, helping them to plan their legacy. All right. And if David isn't here, I I've got his number, so you can <laughs> tell me if you'd be interested. And I'd be happy to help uh, help you get connected with the foundation and to design any kind of gift the way that that you would want to give that make you feel good and and would make you feel like you're being a blessing to people. Um, I'll just say this as we kind of wrap up with David. Um, I've known David for many years, and David has, a, has created a legacy himself. I always think of David kind of like the, the seed caster, the seed planter, going out and casting seeds, and he's planted so many seeds of planned gifts, um, of endowments and those kind of things in the local churches here in Oklahoma, and he's one of the nicest people I know, and so I really appreciate David coming and sharing with us today, and He's a wonderful person to work with. I really appreciate our United Methodist Foundation. So, David, thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Will you help me express our gratitude to David? <laughs> you know, this isn't necessarily a decision you'll make today, but my hope is that you'll think about some of the things we've talked about and think about the ways that God has blessed you and that you might be able to be a blessing to someone else. Uh, in the little brochures, there's a place for more information. You can sign your name. But if any of you would ever want to talk about something like this or even the idea of it, I, my door is open to you, and I would certainly welcome that kind of conversation. But God is continuing to work through our church to bless so many people. I mean, one of the things I think about is that we're feeding between 250 to 300 students over at John Marshall every Friday to take food home on the weekends. And that's just one example People are growing closer to God. I see relationships growing and families being blessed in our church. And God is really at work and alive through the people and through the ministries of our church. I feel so blessed to get to be a part of that. And so if I could be helpful to you in the way that you would want to give a blessing to our ministry and to God and to God's people, I would certainly welcome that. But I guess the question comes, what legacy will we lead? And we create that legacy each day, even now, until the day that we pass. And so I invite you to be thinking about the legacy you're creating and the ways that God can work through you, through our, through our living, through our giving, through our serving, and through all that we do. Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord, you are so good and gracious. 
We thank you that you come into our lives, that you guide us with your Holy Spirit. We pray that you would give us our wisdom so that we would not be foolish like the man in the parable today. We pray that you would help us to think beyond ourselves, beyond this present day, to think of the future, to think of others whom we may bless, and to remember that we're blessed to be a blessing. Oh Lord, we give you thanks. And we thank you for the great generosity you have given through so many people in our church. May we be good stewards of all that you give us, that your name may be known to all people, and that your ministry may be done in ways that transform our community and the world. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. And we all said together, amen.